Let's talk more about where this rally goes from here this morning with Fundstrat Global Advisors, Head of Research, and CNBC contributor Tom Lee, who uh, recently raised his target to S&P 6K. Tom, good to have you. I loved your note the other day looking at what S&P revenue has done in the face of declining inflation. And your general point is that real revenue has accelerated, and that kind of explains why equities have been so resilient. Uh, that's right, Carl. You know, as you know, many investors and pundits thought as inflation fell, and it, it's been cut in half in the last two years, that that would cause revenue growth not only to hit a wall, but that earnings would stall. But instead, S&P revenue growth is, is going to be over 5% this quarter, and on a real basis, that's over two plus 2%, two and that's the strongest. It's really one of the strongest numbers in more than two years. And so it is a really high-quality earnings season so far. And, you know, close to 80%, or actually more than 80% are beating earnings so far. So it's, it's a good beat season, but it's early. Right. And how much of it is due to financials? Is, the, is any kind of tailwind, although we, he we heard various uh, comments about this, is, if a Fed tailwind does exist... Is it likely to affect other areas of the economy as much as the banks? Probably, well, sir. that's Go. what David Costin is talking about today, Josh. Consider allocating to the S&P equal weight and mid caps. And by the way, we've been hearing a lot more about mid caps lately because the S&P mid cap growth um, index has been trading quite well. Costin says from a long term <laughs> relative performance perspective, investors should consider allocating to other indices that benefit from the strength of the U.S. economy, earnings growth and innovation. You take that and you put on top of it what Jamie Dimon is suggesting today at the American Bankers Association annual convention in New York City. Quote, the American economy, the American economy has been kind of booming. Consumers are still doing fine. Home prices up. Stock prices are up. Wages going up. You take those two layers and, uh, and give me your thoughts about this broader market. Yeah, I, so I like that call. Um, and, what, and, and Bryn will remember, but once upon a time, mid caps, <laughs> today's mid caps would have been considered large caps um, not that long ago. And then we started getting these, multi, these uh, multi-trillion dollar market caps. Um, but just looking overall at earnings growth and, and it, it The mention of NVIDIA as a major player in the tech sector highlights its importance in the overall market narrative, especially as it's one of the last major companies to report earnings among the large tech stocks. You know, this is S&P 500, which is fine, but just keep in mind, like, overall earnings growth has been really strong and not just in large caps. But when you think about profits for S&P 500 companies, um, as of as of t uh, today's data, so th this earnings season, we're up 4.3% year over year. Is it scorching hot earnings growth? No, but it's above estimates at the beginning of the season, meaning it's improving as we go along. 74.5% of the companies have beaten earnings. Well, uh, you know, in your opening comments, you talked about industrials, and that's something to watch because last week financials reported, and it, it was, you know, pretty much universally better than expected and financials are doing really well year to date. But the other group that's very sensitive to the Fed cutting would be industrials. And there's a lot of industrial reports this week. It's about a quarter of the S&P, but I'd say it's so far so good. And again, industrials are doing well in the face of an ISM that's kind of been at rock bottom for, for two years now. Tom, how much would you ascribe the recent momentum to aspects of the election as that draws near just over two weeks away? I, th I think that's been a dynamic. I mean, I've been fooled by seasonality because I figured from September to Election Day, markets would be very tentative because this is an extremely close race. I mean, this is a coin toss, according to Nate Silver. But something that Stan Druckenmiller said last week might explain a lot, that markets are betting that Republicans could take the Senate, and that actually could ignite animal spirits. So there may be underlying momentum that the Republicans take parts of Congress, and that's why markets are bullish. And I just think that that's like a, a signal that things are normal. That's not an ultra high beat rate. It's not a low beat rate. Uh, sales are up 5.1% year over year. You could do a lot of things to generate higher earnings. You can't fake sales. So if you've got revenue growth, you've got earnings growth, you've got an acceptable number of um, sectors, I think six out of 11 with year over year growth. Round contrasts this stock's trajectory with that of other major tech giants, which have been experiencing lackluster performance. It doesn't have to just be large cap, doesn't have to just be tech. We're in a really healthy tape. 
Last week, we had a, a, a new all-time high in the NYSE advanced decline line. So long as that's the backdrop, yeah, you can go outside of the S&P 50 and you could find a lot of different things to do. I know I am. So yeah, I, I think definitely. I mean, we we own equal weight, right? But I also think that from a mid cap perspective, that's a really great story because mid caps actually have half of the PE of the S and P, but have actually outperformed both the S and P and small cap over time. And so I think adding something like that, we're adding RSP. I think Rich is spot on. I don't think you're going to have small sort of either quiet or down in the morning, or maybe up a little bit. And by the end of the session, we're up two or three hundred points. It's happened again and again and again. That's right. the characteristics. Uh, that's the characteristics of a of a melt up. Uh, and it's being met with a lot of skepticism. So maybe the ingredients are right. Well, I think that when you look at the performance of the of the market, uh, the best way to think about a melt up is uh, what's the valuation multiple doing relative to earnings? And the valuation multiple has had quite a run. Uh, it's uh, up uh, almost 50 percent since the beginning of this uh, bull market. And uh, earnings have also uh, been Im improving. So the question is, is this a PE-led melt-up or an earnings-led melt-up? Uh, a PE-led melt-up would be reminiscent of the late 1990s. An earnings-led melt-up would be more sustainable. Uh, I think at this point, uh, I'm pleased with what's going on on the earnings side. I think earnings are going to be pretty good in the third quarter. But valuation is definitely stretched. It's not as bad as the melt-up in the late 1990s, but it's getting there. For the past couple of years, many investors have been bracing for a recession. They often looked at indicators such as the yield curve, which is a common signal for economic downturns. When the yield curve uninverts, meaning shorter term interest rates become higher than long term rates, it has historically suggested that a recession may be on the horizon. So a melt up, if we're already in it, maybe we're, we're partially uh, mm -hmm. partially through it, but since the election is in only 15 days, I, I would yep. imagine that any melt-up would have to span, just go right through the election and then into uh, maybe 2025. Does it matter right. to you how the, it is, so the, <laughs> like so many things, maybe the election is just uh, another one of those, um, you know, data points that may or may right. not matter much to what the market does uh, as far as the big picture. Yeah, I, I hope that's the case, but uh, this is probably going to be a very, very close uh, race and maybe a bitterly contested one. And I don't know that that would be uh, a good backdrop for a, for a melt-up. The market might have some second thoughts about that. The other possibility, of course, is a Democratic or a Republican sweep, in which case the market's going to have to be very concerned about uh, deficits being even wider. In recent weeks, he notes an interesting trend even on days when futures are down significantly sometimes by triple digits there has been a remarkable turnaround by the end of the trading session. For instance, the market might start the day lower, but then rally to finish up by 250 or 300 points. Are you at all worried? There were some comments out of I, German PPI was down 1-4 year on year, Tom, but there was some ancillary commentary about worries about a reflationary uh, period, largely due to geopolitical events. We mentioned oil uh, coming back a bit today. How worried are you about that? Well, I think that headline CPI could definitely get affected because oil uh, is oil moves dynamically and it has an immediate, almost immediate effect on headline CPI. And we know transport costs uh, have also spiked recently. Part of it's seasonal, but that affects headline I, I think the market's going to be somewhat skeptical that that could trigger a sustained reigniting of inflation. But I think the economic data is going to be a little confusing the next couple of months because, you know, the, the Boeing strike itself is going to affect the jobs report. But I think ultimately the Fed is still on a path towards getting back to neutral. I think that that should be the focus. And that, that means, you know, stocks which have been strong are really still a buy the dip market. They may be recognizing opportunities in the market, despite economic uncertainties. This influx of cash can drive prices higher, even in the absence of strong economic signals. Thing for the world. Were you surprised they kicked it off with a double rate cut going 50? I, I think everybody's a little surprised, but I think the data at that time showed that the slowdown was occurring. It, the Fed's risk is obviously more to the downside now that they, they are too restrictive for too long. 
and that then cuts off the economy. And right now, as we saw the consumer activity in our client base in the third quarter and then in the month of October so far, it is more consistent with a 2 percent growing economy and a low inflation economy growing at 4, 4.5 percent nominally a year. That, that's a good place. It had softened a little bit in the summer, uh, in June, July and even into August, where I was getting worried that we were down at 3, 3.5, and, and that, that number could indicate that the consumers are giving up. And so the good news is the consumers keep spending, albeit different stuff at every quarter is a little different, but overall, the amount of money they're moving in from our customer base, 60 million plus American consumers, moving well over a trillion dollars in the economy every quarter. It grew up 4.5 percent last quarter, uh, third quarter over last year's third quarter, and is still growing at that rate. That means the consumer is still in the game and spending, which fuels uh, an economy that's stable. But we have to be careful that we don't choke it off, and that's where the higher interest rate impacts on car borrowings and other things affect them. Yeah. In this statement, Tom Lee is reflecting on his observations of the market's performance. He emphasizes it's its resilience, suggesting that it has consistently demonstrated strength even in the face of various challenges. By admitting that he underestimated this resilience, Lee acknowledges that he might have misjudged the market's ability to cope with economic pressures, investor sentiment shifts, or other potential downturns. His comments imply that he has gained a new appreciation for the market's dynamics. This recognition may indicate that he sees underlying factors such as investor confidence, strong corporate earnings, or macroeconomic conditions that have contributed to the market's surprising stability. Overall, Lee's statement highlights both his surprise and respect for the market's enduring capacity to thrive, which could lead him to reassess his predictions or strategies moving forward. Tom Lee is highlighting a significant shift in the dynamics of the financial markets, suggesting that macroeconomic data is becoming less crucial in influencing market trends. Tom Lee is articulating a nuanced perspective on the current investment landscape, particularly regarding stocks. He starts by suggesting that many investors may be underexposed to equities, which could be a strategic misstep given the current market conditions. He acknowledges that there's a prevalent fear of a recession in 2024, a sentiment that has led some to adopt a cautious or bearish outlook. However, Lee counters this fear by highlighting the resilience of corporate earnings. Despite the looming recession fears, companies have demonstrated strong performance, which has contributed to a more optimistic view of the stock market. Lee reflects on the market dynamics of the past couple of years, where there were several attempts to retest market lows in 2022 and 2023. During this time, investor sentiment remained largely pessimistic, and bullish advancements were minimal. However, he now sees a shift in momentum, suggesting that the market's upward trajectory has become almost unstoppable. This change is significant, as it indicates that the market is not easily swayed by negative news or economic indicators. He mentions specific economic indicators, such as the Producer Price Index PPI and Consumer Price Index CPI, which were slightly higher than many analysts had anticipated. This could suggest that inflation pressures are still present, leading to questions about the Federal Reserve's future monetary policy. Despite these indicators, Lee believes that the overall outlook for both the economy and the stock market remains robust. Moreover, he posits that it makes sense for the Fed to maintain a dovish stance, especially since inflation, particularly the Personal Consumption Expenditures PCE Index, is trending towards the Fed's 2% target. This dovish approach indicates that the Fed may continue to lower interest rates or keep them steady to foster economic growth, even amid concerns about inflation. Tom Lee is delving into the current economic landscape, specifically addressing his concerns about the job market and its broader implications. He emphasises that the Federal Reserve Fed needs to take a supportive approach, particularly as economic indicators and labour market conditions appear to signal challenges. By supportive, he likely means that the Fed should consider maintaining or adjusting interest rates to foster economic growth and stabilise employment, especially during uncertain times. Lee also highlights the impact of the upcoming election on market behaviour. He suggests that the political climate has created a sense of ambiguity among investors, akin to a coin toss. This uncertainty has caused many to adopt a wait-and-see attitude, leading to reduced trading activity and less willingness to make bold investment decisions. He believes that as polling data shifts and becomes more competitive, particularly in key swing states, investors might start to regain confidence. Such shifts in perception can lead to increased market volatility as investors react to new information. He also makes a notable comparison between Bitcoin and the stock market. 
Lee mentions that while Bitcoin's value has surged to $65,000, it doesn't necessarily mean that the stock market is performing better or gaining similar momentum. Labor market outlook Lee briefly mentions the labor market, indicating that it appears strong based on recent reports, suggesting that this stability might also influence market performance positively, independent of election outcomes. In the conversation, Tom Lee is delving into the complexities of inflation, specifically referencing the Personal Consumption Expenditures PCE Index, which is a key measure of price changes in consumer goods and services. He starts by highlighting the current PCE rate of 3%, arguing that for the Federal Reserve's inflation target of 2% to be met, there needs to be a significant reduction specifically, a decrease of about one-third. Lee insists that the target isn't flexible, it's firmly set at 2%, not 2.5%, indicating a strict adherence to this benchmark. Lee's concern stems from various external factors that could complicate the path to achieving this target. One of the major points he raises is the volatility in oil prices. As oil prices have recently rebounded to the mid-dollar 70s range, he warns that this could lead to renewed inflationary pressures. Historical trends suggest that spikes in oil prices can trigger broader inflation spikes across the economy, which would be an unwelcome surprise for policymakers and consumers alike. The dialogue also addresses the Federal Reserve's focus on employment data versus inflation metrics. There appears to be a worry that while inflation remains stubbornly high, the Fed may prioritise the job market potentially complicating their approach to managing inflation. As the conversation continues, Lee identifies specific components that have been keeping inflation elevated. He mentions that shelter costs, particularly housing, have been significant contributors to stubborn inflation. However, in recent inflation reports, it seems that these costs are finally starting to roll over, indicating a potential easing in this area. Additionally, he highlights auto insurance as another key factor. It suggested that auto insurance costs are just beginning to decline, and this could act as a positive tailwind in the latter half of the year. If these costs decrease, it could help alleviate some of the inflationary pressures that consumers face. Lee emphasizes that inflation doesn't appear to have many upward drivers at the moment, aside from the potential for commodity shocks. This suggests that while there might be isolated factors that could spur inflation, they are not enough to create a sustained upward trend. This context is important because it sets the stage for his critique of the Fed's current policy environment.